But we'll start with what concerns us here. And one of the big stories, of course, that we've had is the potential in Turkana with the oil project on Tulo Oil. And you've seen what has headlined recently, and that is the community uh, bringing um, their concerns in terms of their benefits to them. And these are some of the concerns that were raised and um, addressed in this uh, Oxfam convened uh, meeting yes, uh, last week, Wednesday and Thursday. I have three panelists who I believe were part of this meeting. Meeting, just to extract a bit more information and the highlights of this uh, meeting, I will have. I'll start with introducing the lady in the panel, Lydia Zigoma. She's the Oxfam Regional Director, and Charles Wanguhu of the Kenya Civil Society Platform on Oil and Gas. And uh, my senior in the profession, and I'm not talking about senior in terms of age, <laughs> but he's quite experienced in terms of economic affairs. Uh, Jaindi Kisero, you see a lot of his articles on the Daily Nation. He's an authority on this. Uh, affair and matter. So let me start with uh, you, uh, Lydia Zigomo, in terms of what you got from this, uh, the recommendations that were made in this uh, two-day conference that was on Wednesday and uh, Thursday last week. Um, the conference really tried to bring um, not only stakeholders from this region, yeah. but also learning from other regions. So we did have um, presentations from places like Ghana as well as from Southern Africa, which was very useful in beginning to think around how uh, this region begins to take forward the Africa mining vision of the African Union. And I think there are lessons to be learned from other regions. SADC has a mining protocol. Um, um, uh, ECOWAS has a mining directive. So this issue about a regional mining agenda around particularly um, um, oil and gas and how we begin to um, articulate our African identity in relation to uh, mineral rights um, and how we want to see extractive industries working in this region okay. and seeing that not just as an issue for the governments of the day but also for the local communities um, of, of course as well as the private sector who are involved in, in the extractive industry. Right, but there seems to be an issue, first of all, domestic issue in sorting out the extractive industry in uh, some of the projects that we have before even looking at the East African region. And uh, we've seen what has happened with the Tulo Oil Project and uh, the concerns that have been raised by the uh, community there. There's that issue of the transparency and uh, of you know the companies that are <coughs> investing in, in the regions, the various regions. Is it any surprise to you what has happened with the Tulo Oil Project? Um, I mean, from our point of view, this, it's not really much of a surprise. We've been working on that issue. We did our first report on the early on the proposed early oil scheme okay. in 2016, and we highlighted the, the likely risks that would uh, emanate from such a project. Because firstly, we said the project is not revenue making, right? Okay. So the issue that it's not revenue making at this initial stage is a point of contention. But does that message get to the uh, people on the ground when you tell them, you know, they, they've come, they hear you've come to get oil. You know that we have the potential. Uh, or, you know, of uh, this uh, particular resource. And you're talking about not having revenue. How does that, you know, get communicated to the people on the ground? Um, it's a big challenge in, in terms of how you communicate, right? Okay. But the challenge there is also, it's also a political challenge, right? The first, the incentive uh, to do the scheme is largely political, right? So if the more transparent you are about the scheme, the more, uh, the more reality hits home that... Mm -hmm. A, there's no revenues, um, and B, you, you might not even have to do it uh, as we've done it, right? Okay. So that message is not clear, and, and that's what's confusing people. Because people are seeing trucks leaving, but they're, not, they're, they're being told there's no revenue. Okay. Right? No revenue for now. Yes. But there will be potential coming up in the next few years. But in a communication, and I don't know if we are to blame as media, because when the potential is announced that, you know, we have some resource, um, we have some reserves in certain regions, and I'm talking about oil for using this as an example because it's what is present in people's minds. Is it our fault that we, you know, celebrate the potential that is out there? And then it communicates, from that potential, it communicates um, fortune for the communities. You see, Mac, I think, I mean, it, it's good enough to go and tell um, the people of Turkana that we are not making money at this stage. But the point is, when a, a, an ordinary person is standing out there, seeing huge trucks moving, you know, moving there, you, you, yes. know, you can't expect, and they, you can't tell them that, you know, there's nothing, there's nothing to share. So part of the problem is really managing expectations. 
and my own of view is that the, the bureaucracy running uh, the institutional framework mm -hmm. running oil oil affairs how, uh, hasn't thought big about how to you know how to deal with um, with the local populace okay. how to manage expectations and how to take public participation beyond beyond uh, CSR beyond building schools you know and how to you know properly engage uh, the mm. Turkana guys and I think we, we if we do not change our approaches our approach I, I think we, we are headed for, for more trouble let's bring it to you know let's bring it home in terms of our responsibility as media because we we you know splash out there that we have great potential is it our fault then that we have created the wrong expectation on the ground for people to know that there is some money and there is some development coming to your region i think i think the, we are part of the problem yes i don't know whether you you you've been to turkana i mean this is a, a region struggling with livelihood expectations more more livelihood options and uh, you know it's you know and you you, you see uh, they tell you that when you are driving there please carry a bottle of water because that's what the last and then we have, we have, there's been this talk about water reservoirs in there so i think we we have played we have played a role in in terms of uh, exaggerating uh, okay. what, what the people there ought, ought, ought to expect okay. i think we we the media uh, have not taken a big interest in what the oil economy is going to look like and what how it's going to impact on on uh, situations like like Turkana. we'll get to the figures and, and what great potential that indeed is realistic to expect um, but in terms of your recommendation then in communicating these prospects and possibilities because that's where it starts uh, when the community hears uh, you know forget first of all just keep EAC, EAC on, on, the, on the back banner for now for the community on the ground for whatever you know extractive uh, potential we have whether it be oil uh, what recommendations do you have in terms of the communication that is put out there? Well, we, we are very clear on certain things. We, we, I want to just unpack pub, what we mean by public participation because the way it has been touted is information sharing or consultation or dispute resolution. It's okay. more than that. Okay. So one of the first things that we're pushing for is free prior informed consent of local communities not at the point of signing a contract but even before so when um, there's discussion uh, uh, any sort of uh, resource has been discovered in their lo loca locality okay. what is done around understanding that resource natural resource and how it's going to be um, exploited um, that also means that there has to be a, a focus or a greater focus on environmental and social impact assessments those would begin to um, look at the environment in which um, this mining is going to take place, the needs of the people. Because la remember that this mining is happening on land, yes. which is, um, has been lived on for centuries in some cases by these local communities. Yes. Land is part of their essential identity. So it's not just a thing like uh, we shall displace people and we'll have a resettlement action plan and people are happy to move on. You've got to think about what comes with that land that will be lost when they are resettled and how you will compensate for all of that. And, and their own role in articulating their identity, what they need and what they, their expectations are. Um, and then also ensuring that they understand the transparency, which I think the Turkana people are still waiting for, on mm. whatever contracts have been signed, so that they understand, and those are broken down to, for them, um, in terms of what has actually uh, uh, been signed in these contracts. What do they actually say about our rights? Okay. And, and how do we access those rights? Okay. Uh, it's one thing to have rights on paper, but they may not Who's mean at the anything. forefront of this public participation? So, I mean, I mean, I know you're saying EAC, but actually um, it's not EAC. African Union has yes. already said that this is an important short-term measure that should be beginning to be rolled out by all governments across Africa. Okay. So, Kenyan government is as... Um, as uh, uh, bound to, to meet that expectation because it's signed up at, at the African Union Summit mm -hmm. of Heads of Government as the rest of the EAC. Mm -hmm. So this is the first thing that is being expected of national governments and the private sector, that we will do free prior informed consent. We will ensure public participation from the beginning of thinking about how to exploit a resource, planning around it, 
environment and social impact assessments and then the, the actual impl implementation and monitoring. Okay. But part of that is also in, in Oxfam's view, the role <coughs> of women should not be lost in this. Women are key because they are the ones working the land. Yes. They're the ones most affected by what's going to happen when we mine the, that land. And remember, mining also comes with water rights because mm -hmm. the extractive industries need water. So you're not only taking a natural res one natural resource, you're taking two natural resources from yes. that same land. So what, And women, as we know, walk miles and miles in Takana and everywhere else to access water for their families. So we need to think around what, is, what are women's part, what is women's participation within the thinking, the planning, the monitoring, the implementation, and okay. the benefits which, will, which okay. will come. Um, I'm told we need to kind of change focus a bit, but there's just a quick mention on something she's mentioned, uh, she's brought up, and the responsibility of the government in public participation. The Extractive Industries Transpar Transparency Initiative uh, that was cited as in, in 2015, have we you know, lived by it? Is it something that we have effected in terms of, you know, making sure that there's full disclosure on these certain extractive industry potentials we have as a nation? So we committed as Kenya to sign up to the Extractive Industry Initiative in 2015. We are yet to sign up to it, uh, okay. but we are also yet to even disclose the contracts. So at the moment, all the oil contracts remain hidden. I uh, am not accessible to, to the public to, for scrutiny or even just review in terms of knowing which blocks have been signed and what are the terms of those contracts. Okay. Welcome back to NTV Today. And uh, just after that conversation with uh, Lois Wangoy, we're getting into more of a national and regional conversation uh, in the extractive industries. And uh, you're talking about the resources that Kenya has. And uh, what we've been having in the news recently was uh, the oil potential that we have from Turkana. And in the first part of this conversation, there was one uh, pointer that came out that the issue of revenue is something that we shouldn't quite expect right now until perhaps 2022 and that's even with an optimistic outlook as has been said by Charles Wangu of the Kenya Civil Society platform on oil and gas. Lydia Zigomo is also representing Oxfam as a regional director and Jaindi Kisero as a, a journalist who's been tracking a lot of economic affairs for the nation. This is an important conversation as Lois was going on with her panelists a lot came out as we were discussing and uh, you might be surprised or not that graft has found its way as well in the extractive industry. And I won't have or push you to discuss that, but if it does come up in terms of uh, why we are where we are, if we are in a fix in terms of negotiating contracts for the nation, is it to blame, is graft to blame? Uh, but as we were in the first conversation, we we're talking a lot about Tulo oil and uh, the prospects for Turkana community and the reality that uh, don't expect money right now. So even the protests that we have been having uh, have been, you know, misinformed, perhaps. Uh, but as you were talking about public participation, in all truth and honesty, these people on the ground at Turkana, they listen to their governor, they listen to their MCA, they listen to their MPs. So how do you involve or engage those at the devolution level, at, the, at that level, county level? to really engage properly and pass on the information that is accurate. Mm -hmm. um, Oxfam, not just in Kenya, but yes. as I said, um, this is an initiative we've been trying to sort of get a sort of movement going by starting with uh, Kenya, Tanzania and Uganda particularly okay. because of oil and gas discoveries in these three nations, um, but also actually beginning to try to pull in um, countries which have traditionally had more challenges around uh, minerals such as uh, gold, uh, diamonds, uh, talk about DRC, mm -hmm. uh, South Sudan, etc. So this is a problem uh, and an area of work that actually is, um, is growing in importance in this region. Uh, we're coming to the table a bit late, I think. Okay. Um, but I think um, in answer to your question, the, the importance of the devolved government uh, system is, pretty, is, is, is something that uh, is, is important in, this, in the way you disseminate and work with all the stakeholders. Mm -hmm. And this has been acknowledged um, in terms of the fact that um, the local government has a role to play. So yes, in this case, it's the county government, um, it could be the regional government in some of the other countries in the region, uh, but it's also the district councils. So how do you get um, uh, at every level of local government 
um, engagement. Mm -hmm. And as I say to you, I think one of the issues is we have to acknowledge is capacity, capacity to understand the issue of this natural resource, capacity to understand um, how what the what what it means from an economic and in industry making. Uh, uh, proposition mm -hmm. and and we cannot always assume that people can know all this just because we have to engage in public education public dissemination of information which is where the role of uh, journalists the media is, is is crucial you can reach further than mm -hmm. uh, an organization like like Oxford McCann community by community because you can use community radio you can use uh, newspapers you can use different forms of um, uh, social media to begin the conversation um, and the more we make everything to do with extractive industries, um, common knowledge, the better it is for in, in, in gendering public participation. And part of this then becomes something that uh, can be a, a, a standing business. Mm -hmm. For instance, in Takana, in their county government meet meetings, yes. because they're supposed to have the public there, they're supposed to have the local community representatives at those meetings. Uh, at the district level, they're supposed to have a district community meetings. and just as we have water committees, mm -hmm. why can we not have committees around the extractives, the, the minerals, yeah. and what's happening around them? We have on agriculture as well. So the health, education. So where is extractives starting to feature within the framework of uh, our local government processes okay. to ensure that we are encouraging that dissemination of information, that debate about what is the best way forward for ourselves, and what, what is out there that we can learn from others yes. uh, and, and begin you've to... You've spoken of common knowledge, place. and in the name of common knowledge is what you had mentioned earlier and what you stand for and push for, and that is transparency. There's some form of elitism when we're talking about these big projects that are expected to come and bring fortune. Um, and yes, it is touted as I'm bringing development to you. Uh, that's, I'm talking about the governors who speak about these projects and potentials in their counties. But it never really uh, is a conversation in terms of when engaging the contract, we're talking about the contracts, when engaging on that. The people, the, the, the impact it has on the, on the counties, it's, it's, they don't seem to be at the forefront of consideration when people are signing this. For instance, now it came out that it's not just Turkana. There are other counties that this project will touch going into 2022. Can you just elaborate on that? Yeah, um, thanks Mark. The, 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 the issue that we need to start addressing and bringing everyone on board is that, for example, if you get a resource in Trukana, it has to get to the coast for it to get to market, right? Yes. If you get the same resource in Baringo or Ajir, again, it's the same, you have mm. to get to the coast, right? So how do you bring, for example, all the counties that are involved? Mm. So from Trukana to Samburu, Isiolo, Meru, Garissa, up to Lamu, how are we bringing all those counties to engage on the issue of oil? Because We're talking the about the pipeline. Yeah, the pipeline <coughs> will pass all those key areas, right? And like I said, I mean, you could tomorrow we could find oil in Baringo, or we could just find it here in Kajado, again, which um, there's ongoing drilling there. Mm -hmm. So how do we start everyone sort of getting that understanding? And like I said, a lot of this, we, we try to say it's very complex, but, it, but it's not. Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of the contracts just basically lay out timelines, right? So timelines, for example, towards revenue, right? Uh, we discussed earlier around, mm -hmm. um, optimistically, 2022 is when you can expect actual revenues that will be shared, right? But we're 2018 now discussing the percentages, right? So if you agreed 5% in 2018, um, and I'm seeing trucks leaving, then how can you justify telling me that, no, the revenues will only come till 2022? It's because we're not, we're not also not being honest brokers in terms of how we're engaging with the communities. Right? Yes. So you have a lot of personal interest coming in, and so you're seeing a lot of sort of political interest as well being masked when it comes to a lot of this public information. Mm -hmm. And that's causing challenges in how we develop this sector. So we have a lot of potential in the sector, mm -hmm. but then there's very many pitfalls as well. Yes. And I think if, you're, if, if we are to judge by the current experiences now, we're already falling into the pitfalls before we actually uh, achieve the potential. You've used a, a, you know, a more uh, democratic, uh, di diplomatic word, uh, falling into the pitfalls. I want to use one that's a bit more direct, and I think it resonates with you, Jaindi. Have we screwed ourselves over already in terms of this project, for instance? I'm, I'm very scared, especially <laughs> about what's happening at the uh, county level. You know what county, counties are? These are entities that can't even absorb, having problems absorbing the revenues that are coming from the national and revenue yes. that's coming from the national government. Yes. And the issues of corruption. They don't have systems and all that. 
and I'm scared that if we if we th we are throwing more revenues at them, right? I'm also scared because you see after the 2020, 2010 10, um, constitution, that constitution left us with a very elevated sense of of, of rights, members of the public with a very elevated sense of rights, mm -hmm. and the hakiye to phenomenon. Mm. I know what you, know, you may know what what happened to uh, the Longo Not Power Project, where communities just you know killed it, and then you have uh, there have uh, there has arisen a group of local local politicians who are very good at funding funding issues, working with the uh, you know carrying backpacks in every seminar that's going on in the Turkana region. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's a, it, it, it's a it's a it's a it's a bomb waiting to explode, and we could end up with these ogoni ogoni type things if we do not think about this thing well and structure it and disseminate information and get them engaged, yeah, okay. the, the way the way they the ought to. Right now we're tracking the oil, and it's in the perhaps we could call it the testing uh, period of of phase of the project. Do you see potential in that piping, uh, the pipeline for the nation and a revenue for us? You see, the best organized oil producers make sure that the, the state invests in every stage of the supply chain. That's a bit selfish, wouldn't you think? That's what we should do. <laughs> and uh, it, it shouldn't just be ours only. We, we can own the oil if we had a strong national oil corporation, which we don't. Because our national oil corporation is not even involved in this, in this conversation. Our Kenya pipeline, which has been the only pipeline in the region for many years, we've been running a pipeline for in excess of 30 years. I don't. There's no, there's no other one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in in the East African region, and we have we have capacities. And just the other day, just right now, you know, we we are, we are supposed to to have finished uh, building this thing. Zakim is doing. Yet, if you see the plans for the pipeline, right? And I, I had access to something done by um, uh, an advisor, an investment advisor. The 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 parties hired. The parties, namely Talo, Mask, and the state, and all that, mm -hmm. right? The thinking is that we, we have a we have a, a pipeline that is owned by us and them. Yeah, we don't the storage facilities, the refineries. We are not going to be playing, in, you know, in all that space. So I think the big issue here is national interest. Mm -hmm. As a country, I have defined our national interests. <coughs> uh, you know. But, she, and Lydia, you mentioned earlier when they come in, they're experts at negotiating these contracts and the deal and what's sweet for them. So should we be repositioning ourselves? One country that's been mentioned is Tanzania. Uh, should we be repositioning ourselves or, you know, kind of re-strategizing how we engage with partners, international partners that come in to help us, you know, explore the fortunes and resources that we have? Yes, um, I think we do. We need to be doing that. And um, we were talking uh, during the break about the need for that not just to be at a national level. So I fully understand and support your thinking about national interest, but I think also regional interest. the regional interest. interest. Because these resources are often, um, as we will find in time, can also be across nations. Um, and and therefore the cross border interest is 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 key, and also even how we export etc may also involve other nations depending on whether you have access to a coastline mm -hmm. or not. So the more we begin to think of the regional interest as well as and alongside the national interest, the more collective power we have to shift the goalposts because these companies are working across our countries. Yes. So in my view, the governments need to see that this is in their best interests to actually come together and collectively beginning to articulate the regional interest and, and how they skill themselves up um, with the right support to be able to negotiate better, to be able to think about what are the different alternatives uh, if we don't go the contracting route, what else is there, is, the, is this issue of a fund or whatever you want to put in place, but think it through mm -hmm. and think how, how you'll make it actually happen. Um, but also ensure that you protect each other because uh, the collective also means we we're talking about the issue of um, then the fact that they are bilateral uh, relationships and, and uh, that are linked to the contracting relationships with the companies um, that Charles was mentioning. And, and I think understanding that it's not just the company you need to think about, but it's the national government from which that company is based yes. um, who may come in support of their, of their company. So the more we are 
as a collective coming together because we have the resource that they all want. Mm -hmm. The more we can also have um, safety in numbers and, and, and uh, more of a critical mass to push certain agendas, we cannot push in. Would you say Tanzania, and I'll, I'll, I'll throw it to you, Charles, in a moment. Would you say Tanzania is... Uh, is looking more inward. He mentioned something about Magufuli's mm. uh, newfound um, campaign mm. against what he feels has been a raw deal for his mm. country. So would you mistake him for looking inward first, dealing with Tanzania? I think he needs to understand that what he's dealing with is sometimes not, is, is not just affecting t Tanzania and will not just be resolved by Tanzania going it alone. Okay. And therefore, how he brings his fellow uh, uh, statesmen from from neighboring countries into the same discussion, to be for them to begin to see their national interests as well in the same fight that he has uh, going on would right. actually be um, would be uh, key. I think, um, dare I say it? I think um, we, there's something to be said for someone like President Kagame, and the way he does his thinking around the vision, mm -hmm. the national interest but also not necessarily being divisive within that, but finding a way where it can be as much as possible when, when you're talking about the pipeline. Um, I, I want to make an, um, um, a sort of a link with a different yeah. sector. I visited a, a national treatment and sewerage pl plant, big one that they've set up with the support of the Turkish, uh, a Turkish company and the Turkish government. But the, the government of Rwanda was thinking ahead they were saying, okay, we don't have the capacity and skills right now, mm -hmm. but how do we go alongside this process such that we can replicate and duplicate it ourselves elsewhere? And therefore, we begin with them, but we know when to take over from them yes. and actually make it our own. <laughs> and I, I thought... But they know this. Smart, they know you want strategy. to take over. Yeah. So wouldn't they put some uh, measures yes, to... Yes, but it's avoid. how you understand and are guided by your understanding of how to negotiate a win-win. Yes. Um, and, and I think this is something that's the skill. That's, those are the skills we need to learn how to do that and be effective in that. But if you don't have a national agenda, if you don't have a clarity about the national vision and interest, sometimes it's difficult. That's where people get um, fall into the pits that uh, yeah. Charles was referring to. Charles, I mean, in terms of uh, renegotiating, as, as, as she's mentioned, Kagame being very smart in how he's uh, going around for the interest of the nation first, you know, to bring as much uh, back to the nation, keep as much for Rwanda. And when we're talking about Kenya, there's a lot of word about us mortgaging our country and, and in these deals that we get into. Um, is there room then for renegotiation, especially having already signed? Um, it's very difficult to renegotiate, um, especially contracts that have been signed for in, in the long term, right? And the challenge about that also is is because also of our short-term outlook. We tend to have a short-term outlook because of our political cycle, right? Mm -hmm. So we're only looking through a five-year cycle. I think if if a lot of people are looking from Kenya outside, they think there's nothing that's happening until 2022, right? <laughs> Even though, you know, we Kenya is still sustainable after, after that for a very yes. long time. So are we planning for that long term? We talked about the pipeline, for example. Um, and there's a good example, again, that she's given from Rwanda, in terms of how do we build those skills. We have less than five welders, Kenyan welders, mm -hmm. right, at the moment, who can actually undertake um, the work that's required at the scale level for a pipeline. So how long is it going to take us to build a capacity for those, for us to be able to build our pipeline, right? It would mean that, again, a more extended period uh, before we get revenues, right? So is that a sacrifice that people are willing uh, to make at the moment? And, and that's the challenge, right? Mm -hmm. um, I want to just touch a bit on the regional aspect because I, I, I really wanted to comment before. We are also failing in terms of that regional cooperation. Now we're building two pipelines. Mm. Initially, we're going to build one, Uganda, uh, Kenya, and then uh, to the coast. But we didn't agree. So we didn't agree. So now we're building two, right? So that's those are extra capital costs that if we had come together, for example, as Kenya, Uganda, and Tanzania and agreed, okay, so Uganda is getting the refinery, uh, we'll, we'll build a pipeline out to the coast in Kenya, but uh, Tanzania will build maybe another a gas, for example, a, um, a gas pipeline that will again help support the regional, whether it's power or or our shift again, because you're also moving away from, from sort of the fossil fuels. Right? Yes. And gas is a transitional. Mm -hmm. And Tanzania has a whole ton of gas, mm -hmm. right? So how, 
are we sitting and agreeing on these things or are we again now all going sort of a race to the bottom so we're saying oh this time we're coalition of the willing so we exclude tanzania then the next time tanzania and uganda come and say okay now we're excluding kenya we'll build a pipeline that way so again those are the things that we are sort of failing in terms of now taking up those opportunities to scale up because mm -hmm. like, even if we build our national oil corporation um you know are we building it so it can be a regional uh, uh, corporation so that in future it can be the one investing, for example, as a company in Tanzania or in Uganda in oil? So what are we building these capacities for? Um, so we need to, again, have that thinking and longer term thinking. If I, if I, if I understood you right, Jandy, when you mentioned you know, strengthening a national oil corporation, it's more for us. How much is in it for Kenya? Is that approach um, sustainable? Especially looking at what um, no, Manfuli no. is saying. I mean, it's, it's what everybody else who's successful is doing. Yes. I'm not saying, you know, this is what everybody's doing. I mean, look at Norway Start Oil, or look at Saudi, Arab Saudi Aramco, or look at those guys of Thailand and, and, and Malaysia. All of them have the very strong national oil corporations. So that you're saying, okay, if you're building for us a, a pipeline, okay, come, come along, I'll take 40% of it. Well, I take 6% of it, you take 40%. Then you have national interest, mm -hmm. you know. Then secured. you have and, and then you have, you, have, you have secured, and then you have capacity. That's basically that's that, that's what I'm saying. Look at the national oil corporation that we had. The bloody thing has been existing since '78, I think. Mm -hmm. It's a shell, yeah. But and they're not even involving them in in this in this process. They are involving them in the sense that they give them some blocks. They have some blocks which they are sharing with with some Japanese, I think. Mm -hmm. And then they also have a very good um, uh, resource, you know, when, when an investor comes here, that's where to go to find out how much, if you're given a block, that's where to go to find out information about that block, uh, the seismics being done and what, you know, they have a fairly good repository of, of, of information about, about blocks. Mm -hmm. But beyond that, it's just a, just a, a center for, for games being played, for politicians uh, staffing boards with, with their relatives and all that. That's all, all, all it was. But the, the, the institutional respect in, in this sector is Kenya Pipeline. I mean, you've heard all the stories about, about corruption and all that. Yes. But we have a strong national institution there, yeah, which has run a pipeline for many years. Two, they are building another one from their balance sheet. They borrowed money from their balance sheet, yeah, and, 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 and are, are finishing this. How are we involving them? in the new pipeline. Can we really afford to leave them out? Which is what these guys are trying to do. In yeah. the long run, if you're talking about affording, yeah. and you've, you just described them as a shell, yeah. what's wrong in engaging, perhaps, they're known to be well uh, placed in uh, putting infrastructure, Chinese? What there's, would be wrong with that? They'll be fast, they'll be efficient. They'll there's there. nothing wrong in involving Chinese. What, I'm, what I mean is in engaging with Chinese, what should, what should be up, up, upmost is national interest. They what should come and work for us. I mean, if you look at the, the, the service contracts that I, I talked about, the guys who you engage with have come to work for you. The oil is yours. Dig, dig the, the oil for me and I'll pay you. Yes. Transport and I'll pay you. you know? That's the trend with the, with the with service contracts which most of this Arab, uh, Arab, Arab world is yes. using. That's basically what I'm saying. National interest yes. and long-term national interest. Right. Yeah. He mentioned uh, this, you know, when it's talking about service contracts versus PSAs, could you, uh, could we elaborate on this just for the layman, uh, the service contracts and why, you know, they might be a bit more favorable now or it's the, what people are leaning towards over the PSAs, the PSAs and what those are. Yeah, I mean, so there's been a transition in terms of how people contract and, and how people look at contracting in terms of benefits, right? So the service contracts is you, you bring in someone who's just your contractor, you're not sharing profits, you just pay them a fee yes. as you'd pay, for example, a plumber, right? Um, but now our challenge is in Trukana we've discovered about a billion barrels. Yeah, so we're still very at the at the lower end. We're not absolutely we're not a Libya, uh, mm. you know, who has 400 barrels or 400 billion barrels or or Saudi Arabia, right? So we are not at that level. So in terms of, it's a challenge when you're coming to negotiate when you have mm -hmm. a small resource. It's a whole different thing when you have a huge resource and you're saying, look, we, we are speaking on our terms. So, I mean, for Kenya, what we need to do is to have this 
the Trukana project as a standout project where we say we're able to deliver um, you know, uh, in, in time and, and, and all of those things without any challenges so that we can say now we are an oil producer then now we can negotiate better contracts. So you can get better contracts, but if you have a model where you say, you know, we're doing very well. Mm -hmm. If you have a situation like we have now where we have stoppages every time, then when you go to market, people are not going to be as attractive. Because then what you're trying to do is attract capital. Mm -hmm. um, and like I said, to bring, again, the regional challenges, you don't want to be, when you're competing with your neighbors like Tanzania or Uganda or Ethiopia, for example, around the same, trying to attract the same capital, then you have to, you have to put a, a good deal in front of um, the investors. Yeah, and he's mentioned something, in, and I want you to mention or uh, talk about the service contracts and PSAs and how we can perhaps move what we should be moving towards in terms of having a sustainable and more conducive um, you know uh, profitable uh, outlook for a nation but he's mentioned competition that kind of uh, fights what this corporation uh, that we would want to have because in the name of competition and that's why we have two pipelines now if you sleep on the job I'll want a deal that is more favorable to me and will bring more revenue to my nation so does that can there be a balance with the competition and cooperation that is expected? I think um, it's a challenging one to have a balance mm -hmm. um, because obviously the person with um, uh, better res uh, resource of the, uh, that natural resource is in a better place than someone who has got less yes. of the same. And unfortunately we come to the point that Charles was making earlier about um, what's driving uh, some of the decisions that are being taken and um, doing the things that are being done in, in the countries. So the motivations behind why leaders uh, decide something is, is, is valuable or their legacy mm -hmm. um, may be things that from a more objective point of view you might say maybe that shouldn't have been the issue. Um, but once that's in the room, then the ways in which we are all able to negotiate with each other change. The game changes um, because cooperation or collaboration becomes uh, challenging to achieve. Mm -hmm. um, I, I do think they are those who have it easier than others. But I also think that, um, firstly, I, I think that, I mean, at the conference that we had, there were those who were even challenging the issue of contracts and saying, why are we going the contract ro uh, route because we are not doing that well with it? Why don't we go the policy and, you know, just having a, a good policy framework or a legal framework uh, that, that provides the maybe a better um, uh, overarching framework from which then to, d to uh, do these, uh, these, these arrangements so within the extractives industry. And I, I think we need to be doing the, 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 the research and the studies of which one, if any, is working better, but yeah. also what are the pitfalls of each and the pros and cons of each. But I think the, Charles, the point Charles is raising is something that uh, is difficult to deal with where the parties at the table are not, are not coming with equal, um, uh, an equal pos position or, mm -hmm. or power. Um, and I would say humbly, then the weaker party should understand they're the weaker party. Yes. Uh, and we should allow the other party to, uh, uh, who has more of the resource and everything else, to have maybe a bigger say. Mm -hmm. But maybe that's a more gendered perspective of understanding that actually power is not always equal and we are trying to do what is in the best interests, not just of ourselves, but of those who may already have greater power. Yes. So I'm in, in a roundabout way. I'm saying that the the, the level field here was not level, and instead of people having walked away, maybe they needed to come back and understand the field is not level. Our our interests uh, and our what we can get out of this is less than someone else because we just have less of the resource. Okay. But also, it's not just about the resource, but also the thinking about the value chain of the whole industry because I think we get so caught up on mining uh, I was just interested in looking at the figures of those who are actually employed directly in mining mm -hmm. so Tallow in its 2017 annual report uh, directly in mining was 1,000 jobs um, total um, was uh, 11,000 
um, in their uh, you know exploit uh, exploitation and development uh, sec exploration and development sector mm. so actually mining mining itself is not going to create a huge boom of jobs um, and 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 therefore while we need to take care of the the issues around uh, protecting our national interest we also need to understand that the mining venture itself is not the end of the, the road there are other ways in which we can create better employment opportunities better benefits for ourselves as a nation and our people mm -hmm. through the value chain so looking at all the things that should that follow that mining industry and thinking about how are we also negotiating to get the best out of uh, the creation of jobs along that whole value chain okay um, so that it's not just about the mine it is not just about the resource it is all the industries that will come out of and arise from the service industries etc all um supporting that mining venture who's getting the jobs who's who's benefiting think the long term think mm. holistically and ensure that um you're not losing out on, on all of that okay and you could even by the way you can also be clever again i use the example of president kagame yes um chiseni and goma look at what he's done on his side of the border mm -hmm. <laughs> so you can also benefit from something that is actually in an, on the other side of the border in other ways on your side by thinking about those service industries by thinking about the long uh, the the holistic um, uh, vision of what is required to actually make that industry and related industries work so i think we need to really be thinking uh, differently than we've been thinking okay. and in doing that maybe our negotiation power rises not just f focused on just how much of the natural resource we have yes but we might be talking about this in the name of uh, creating information and putting it out there in terms of what we should be changing or re-strategizing to bring more for the nation but when you're talking about the service contracts or the PSAs that you've mentioned, I, at first did, I didn't get an, you know, a clarification on what they really mean. You've talked about the service contracts, but the PSAs, those people negotiating this are at the top. It, it, it doesn't sound or seem to involve those, the communities that it impacts. But explain further why you feel the PSAs are, you know, uh, service contracts are better than the PSAs. No, which is no, no I, I cannot sit here and uh, claim that I'm. I have the interpretive authority on, on, on <laughs> whether a country should go PSA. Yes. Or, no, but in or, terms uh, of best practice, what, yeah, yeah. what has been. I, I can only say what what, yeah. what 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 can see in the public domain. Yes. Which countries are going PSAs and which countries are uh, going service. are going service contracts, and what what I find uh, persuasive with service contracts is that. If you, the, the law says that that oil first says that the law belongs to me, you can come and help me build the process and I pay you for it. And and that PSAs you end up with a better yield for the country uh, in service contracts than than, um, than PSAs. And I think that's one of the challenges uh, Tanzania has come to. Some yes. Tanzanians are just asking us simple questions. How about us? Yeah, that's what I'm fully saying. Am I getting enough, right, of, of my own resource? And then they find themselves, they, they found themselves, their hands tied in all these PSA contracts and other things. They are, now they are doing a, they are like trying to, you know, untangle themselves. To right? untangle themselves, which is also a big, big political issue, which has implications in your relations with other countries yes. and, and trade contracts you have signed. So I don't, I'm not, that's what I said, I'm not even too sure that I'm, co I'm convinced that they've done the, right, the, yes. right, the right thing. But at least it starts by asking the questions, how about us, how, you know, yes. what is the national interest here? And that's so really what two, people are asking on the ground as well. I mean, there's two, there's, two, there's two questions there. The first question is whether we know what we have, mm. right? Yes. So if you don't know what you have, then the PSA helps, right? Explain what that PSA is. So the production sharing agreement, basically, quick and dirty of it is, you get someone to come in, invest mm -hmm. in finding out what you have, yeah. right? And then if they find something, you share. Mm -hmm. If they don't, then you know that's their loss. They walk away, and and you're fine, right? Because you have not spent any of your own money. Is that the case with Tolo? Yes. Okay. So if they didn't find any resource, so they'd spent. They said they've spent now what, almost two billion US dollars. If they spend that money in terms of seismic and drilling and didn't find any resource, then they walk away and that's their loss. Yeah. Okay. But now that they found something, now we have to go back and say, okay, uh, we have to pay you back for what uh, what you spent, 
and then we'll share the profits that come from it. So in, in a frontier country, that, that makes sense. Because what you also don't want is your government spending two billion US dollars of taxpayer money on, uh, is actually on a gamble that, yes. that they might not find a resource. Yeah. And so that's the challenge of the production sharing uh, agreement. Right? It's, it's perfect if you don't know what you have, but if you, if you know what you have, then a service contract is better because again, you, you get all, all the revenues and things. But the production sharing contract, you share. But now, yeah. as he's mentioned, Magufuli finds himself in a fix because you have breach of contract. How do you get around that? Again, and that's why we were pushing for even transparency of production sharing contracts from the beginning, so that you know what is being signed. Because if you don't know what's being signed, you can't even analyze, right? Mm -hmm. So at the moment, we don't know what kind of contract we signed with Talo in terms of the future revenues. Yeah, we are fighting about a percentage, saying our oh, county will get 20, national government will get 75, but we don't even know what those revenues look like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which which makes that conversation like we are just sort of shooting in the dark, so that when we start production. And then the percentages start going down, then you have conflict stemming from that. Because yes. people will say, no, we were expecting to get X. Uh, but, you know, but we, don't, we haven't seen the contract. Until mm -hmm. you see the contract, then it's only when you can start modeling. And then, if you, then you add the extra layer of complication, which is the oil price. We don't know what the oil price is going to be at that point. <laughs> right? Another interesting thing is yes. that you put yourself in a situation of uh, the risk of allowing the IOC I mean the international oil company to be the one to determine the costs because they're the ones doing it. So they'll call this cost oil, this is what. They have all manner of terminologies yeah. to demonstrate to you that I spent so much in getting this barrel and that you can only get this. That, that's the reason why, why this, when NGOs, are, uh, these chaps <laughs> push for, <laughs> for transparency, yes. the, the Oxfam and then they, they are really on a, on, on a good thing because it's so so important to understand the, the you know the, to get to know the transparency of the operations of these guys and how they determine those costs the big issue you're talking about negotiations capacity to negotiate on our side mm -hmm. we we don't have very good capacity in 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 area of negotiation with foreign investors whether they're oil companies yes or 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 whatever but i, I in the in the bill it's not all lost in the bill which is still before parliament the, there's a proposal to create a new regulatory, a new institution to deal with these issues, mm -hmm. uh, which I think is a, is, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a good development. It shows that guys, guys are thinking. I also think that um, that chap called Andrew Kamau, the PS, I think since he got in there, things have changed because he's an oil man. I mean, I wish these guys could be appointing guys yeah, <laughs> who have uh, domain knowledge and understanding Right, deep domain knowledge and understanding of, yes. of whatever. Exactly. I think oil diplomacy started really when uh, when um, Andrew Andrew Kamau got in. Andrew Kamau got in. Mm. But let's see what what they'll do after the, ba the, the bill is passed and what kind of institution they want to create to you know, so that so that we can start having the big dis the big conversations we we are talking about PSA or or, or whatever. How do we tr transit mm. national interest? How, what, how, at what stage do you want to invest in the value chain? Do you want to, to uh, a new refinery for ourselves? Yes. Yeah. And can we go to the market and borrow, borrow, raise money in another couple of markets and build storage tanks, right? Mm -hmm. That I think that then we can start moving that way. So we are really waiting for the bill and, and, and see what kind of institutions will will come up with once once, the, once that bill is in place. Lydia, when you talk about because you you deal a lot with the region and when you talk about the transparency of these contracts don't you face the challenge of having a country tell you this is between us and the investor w w your business y is not here mm. you know so let us deal with our people I mean bringing them from that kind of uh, perspective or view to that of it's beneficial to us as a region if we act openly mm. and in the sense someone like Magufuli would not be isolated if we all knew what was mm. in the deal so we could discuss as a region as mm. a block and we'd learn from each other as well yes so other countries would not make the same mistakes Tanzania made <laughs> so th this is the interesting thing so yes I, I we do I mean there's always a pushback on um, uh, this issue of uh, transparency of, of these contracts and I think to me, that's part of what I call the movement building. Yes. Um, and it's not, it's not necessarily an Oxfam 
only agenda here we're, we're with all these civil society local organizations it's about actually transparency not just not to oxfam mm -hmm. that's not where the obligation lies it's transparency to your own people because the national nation uh, that resource that natural resource you are uh, contracting with uh, outsiders about is their resource yes it's their country their citizens of that country and on top of that, whatever you're going to do with that uh, external uh, company is going to impact on their lives. Any debt you're incurring is going to impact on future generations of your own citizens. Mm -hmm. um, any industry you're hoping to create is for the benefit of your local people. So the first obligation is transparency to your own people. And I think this has been reson it resonates with what the African mining vision actually says because they have acknowledged at that level as heads of state mm. um, that that is required. That is in the short term, public participation is about ensuring transparency for, uh, for uh, the local people in the whole process. And for me, it's not just about transparency of the contract because um, I'm, as a lawyer, I know that uh, I can contract for I can I can uh, represent you and contract whatever I contract. Yes. But actually, what what we, what we're pushing for is that the local communities where that resource uh, uh, is found have a right to be part of the contracting process. Mm -hmm. So it's, so it's not about finding out later that this is what our governments have done on our behalf. It's about actually them being. Um, participants in the whole process, mm -hmm. together with the private sector pre uh, who, who are coming in um, to mine the resource. I, I, I come back to this issue of Turkana and the disruptions which have happened, and I, I'm left thinking, if people had done things differently and transparently mm -hmm. from beginning, well, you wouldn't have so many disruptions. The disruptions come because local people do not understand what's going on. Yes. And they are starved of the right information. Information is power in Africa, but it can also... But don't those leaders use it then in the name exactly, of power to their exactly. advantage? But they don't realize that by sharing that information, actually that, that, that goal that they are seeking to achieve might be achieved even better because you will have the people along with you for the ride. Mm -hmm. And the company should also see a benefit in this. I think some of the companies from the Transparency in, 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 in Initiative are beginning to understand that it's in our own best interests. Yes. We want to get on with the job we've been employed to do and we have sunk in our money to do from our investors. This is disrupting our work. So actually, it's, it's also uh, to an extent a benefit to them that they be the, the communities be uh, fully engaged and, and participating and understanding what's going on so they are not disrupted in the work that they're doing. So to me, it's a win-win for government, for private sector, and for the local community if they begin to see each other as equal parties at the table okay. from the beginning. And, and I'd want you to uh, comment on the issue of duplicity in terms of the, the nation. When a, an investor comes, they might find an issue where they're dealing with different ministries and that brings a challenge in terms of making a deal and really getting to work and also to the concluding comments uh, in this issue of extractive um, industry and and in the conversation we've been having here it's a bit different but it's about the extractive industries and we've talked largely about the benefits that lie or the potential of the benefits to different communities and uh, different countries within the region uh, as we conclude this uh, part I'd like to you know look more on the impact on the community uh, in terms of the actual activity. For instance, what we have, you know, the exploit, ex exploring of oil uh, reserves and potential and the impact it would have on the community. How is this accommodated um, and how does, you know, Oxfam, for instance, look into that for the community, for the benefit of the community? So we are um, um, sort of encouraging and, and really pushing that um, governments in this process um, put front and center uh, environmental and social impact assessments and see them as something that's done in a multidisciplinary and multi-sectoral way, yes. but also uh, including the participation of the local communities that will be affected. So from the very beginning, because we should have a baseline of mm -hmm. what is the situation uh, environmentally and socially in this community and then be able to monitor against that baseline as uh, the explora exploration and then on into development uh, and exploitation um, uh, happens that we have an understanding of what's changing and what's being impacted upon. And then that 
that information is taken into consideration in whatever contract negotiations because although there's a contract mm -hmm. um, it is reviewed at certain points as certain information becomes known as, as Charles was talking about earlier so in that process this this these assessments should also be part of what's being looked at okay. and uh, we should also be seeing whether there's a need for that community to be actually resettled um, and if they're being resettled, in addition, there should be a participatory process to come up with a resettlement action plan that involves that community again. All so right. it's not just the government um, and the companies deciding on behalf of the community what that resettlement looks like, but the community itself being part of that discussion yes. and speaking um, to its uh, own understanding of its identity, its needs, and uh, its expectations and hopes and what, what it wants. And with place. that, they will own it better. You They'll know, own this it better. It will be theirs. It won't be seen as, you imposed. know, one of the, mm. yes, imposed or one of those things that are being, bringing disruption to their community. And is this accommodated in the contract? For instance, if uh, after some exploration has started and then there's a health problem that comes up given what is being done by the industry. That I know that communities are relocated, so they're in a safe distance. But is there anything in the contract to protect the communities? So there's an assumption um, that these these contracts have long-term benefits, right? The yes. assumption is that our benefits outweigh the impacts, yes. so that we, we are able to cushion whatever impact. So if there's long-term health, for example, would have benefited over that long period of time, that we'd be able to, you know, uh, to to take take up that that impact, mm -hmm. and that's a challenge. That when we're doing this analysis, it's not always clear that in the long term uh, you will not have more impacts uh, as opposed to the benefits. Yeah. Right. And one of the challenges, just to switch it a bit, is also the the different mandates between the different ministries. Right. So you have a ministry of trade that's just rushing to get as as many companies uh, on board. Um, you have a Ministry of Treasury just rushing to revenues. To them, they just want revenues, right? Um, you have a ministry, ministry, I mean, the Ministry of Trade is also signing, for example, double taxation agreements to just, again, attract, attract more investment. Mm -hmm. But there's not enough time looking at what are the impacts, what are the actual impacts over the longer period of time. Yes, you might get short-term revenues, okay. but, but will the community be better off in the long term, right? right? Because the community takes the biggest brunt of these investments. They're losing their livelihoods, for example. Mm -hmm. um, they, you know, it's a drastic change to them. There's a huge influx of people coming in. Mm -hmm. um, before they were, they were largely, you know, they're not as open uh, or exposed to the Kenyan economy. Now you're ex being exposed to things like speculation, for example, around land. Mm -hmm. So you're seeing fencing, right? Yes. So while pastoralists were able to move in freely before, now okay. they're, they're actually now stuck there. By the time they take the animals one place, they come back and there's a fence. All right. So, I mean, so they, they take the biggest brunt and that's a challenge of Bona Jaindi, I mean, sometimes when there's an issue that comes up, this is in, in the next few seconds, I just want you to wrap up. We have the challenge of sometimes cover up the story because in the name of development, this project is bringing more fortune than what you're talking about, the impact on the community. Uh, how do we balance that, the interest of the community and the development yeah, agenda? Yeah, the big problem we have in the media is that we present it as fortune <laughs> and, and, not, and not development. There's a difference between quantitative development and qualitative growth yes and i think we really need to think rethink rural development i mean it's good enough these oil companies uh, will build schools d d sink boreholes and mm -hmm. not enough but what, what it is if you have a, a rural community with schools and whatever when members they have assets when the members are suffering from malnutrition we want to see very broad comprehensive programs including cash cash transfer programs okay yeah i'd like to see guys given uh, yes given chapa you know so that the community sees value all right yeah i'd like to wrap it up at that point sorry to rush it but we're out of time but we've had a good time to uh talk about the extractive industry and some of the prospects some of the things that we can learn some of the things that we can transition into for 